Welcome to Bloomberg Law on Demand. I'm Lee Pacquia. States Attorneys General continue the, their efforts to settle the ongoing conflicts regarding claims that mortgage companies violated states' laws when processing foreclosures. Meanwhile, federal regulators have weighed in with a solution of their own. Joining us now to discuss, Peter Harvey. He's the former Attorney General for the state of New Jersey, and he's now a partner at the law firm Paris & Belknap, based here in New York City. Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you. Okay, so we're talking about how to fix the process by which banks can foreclose on defaulted mortgages. Take us through it. What's wrong with their processes previous to now? Well, one of the problems is in the old days, you would go to your local bank, you'd uh, qualify for a mortgage, you'd sign the note and mortgage, and that bank would hold on to the paper for the length of your mortgage, whether it was 15 years, 20 years, or 30 years. Uh, now, a lot of this paper is being sold and so you have the originating institutions which may not even be a bank may just mm -hmm. be a loan originator you have um, these these loans being packaged and sold to back mortgage bonds and now you have loan servicers right. so part of the debate that's going on now is number one who owns the rights and once you decide that it's mortgage servicers how do you process mortgages that are in a delinquent status or even in default mm -hmm. and that's the big fight what will be the protections given to the homeowner versus what will be the protections given to the bank? Right. So the rules and regulations we had prior to the securitization era aren't quite up to speed, we're finding at this point. They, they Is that did a good not, way to put it? That's, that's right. Yeah. It, those rules and regulations didn't contemplate today's economic environment with mortgages. Mm -hmm. They really didn't contemplate mortgage-backed securities. So we've had a flurry of developments um, uh, relating to the nationwide investigation that all attorneys general from the 50 states have put together. In the meantime, the uh, Office of the Comptroller of, Cons of Currency and the Federal Reserve have come out with their own uh, suggested uh, rules and regulations that should be imposed uh, on banks and servicers at this point. What do you make of that? What, what was in there that, uh, that jumped out at you? Well, I think that what the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency is trying to do is make it easier for banks to try to uh, process these loans, both with respect to delinquent loans as well as perhaps mortgage modifications. I don't think that their protections uh, in their agreement is going to satisfy the state attorneys general. Right. I think the state attorneys general are really focused on homeowners and, and they are faced in a lot of states with a wave of foreclosures which means empty properties and non-tax producing properties. Right. When this consent order came out, if you can jump into your, your previous life for a moment, mm -hmm. is that an uh-oh moment for a state attorney general? Is, or is this, you know, I mean, I can't be happy news. No, it isn't, because mm. one of the issues that a state attorney general would be concerned about would be preemption. Right. To what extent uh, will the re resolution reached by the federal government stop you from reaching a resolution that might be more favorable for the consumers living in your state? Right. So you have to be concerned about that. So is that the practical effect of, of the OCC's action? It can it, be. Does it, it undercut not, the AG's efforts? It, it, it may limit the AG's in some areas, in areas that are exclusively in the domain of the federal government. It mm -hmm. does not limit the AG's with respect to other areas. And part of the reason why is a 2009 Supreme Court decision that said that the attorneys general General could not use visitation power with respect to banks, meaning they couldn't come in and look through the books and records and make recommendations mm -hmm. about how the banks ought to conduct their business, but they could sue them right. under state consumer fraud laws. Right. When you look at, at, at what's being fought over here, there seem to be three things that have people uh, most worried. Mandatory modifications yes. uh, of mortgages, principal reduction, and then the potential fine issue. Some people have said it could be as high as $25 billion. Are any of those elements that could be preempted under what the OCC has done? Not necessarily, especially not if the banks agree to them. I mean, if the banks agree to it, it becomes a binding contract like anything else. Part of what you're seeing now is some of the AGs are a little troubled by this, and four states in particular are raising public objections to it because they think that it's going to create problems with banks in their own state. And some AGs, I'm sure, are concerned about does this impact the ability of banks or the desire of banks to actually loan money to mm. new homeowners. Mm. I, I'm glad you brought up the four attorneys general who are, are now starting to raise their own concerns outside of the, the broader group. You've worked on uh, nationwide investigations like this. What are the dynamics like when you get 50 uh, state attorneys general in the same room 
so to speak. Uh, is it like herding cats or what? It's exciting. Uh. It's exciting with 50 AGs. Uh, different states have different interests. Some mm -hmm. states have strong banking interests in their state. Some states have fewer foreclosures in their states. Other states have very large foreclosures and they have a lot of people being pushed out of their homes. The states who uh, have high rates of foreclosure and people being pushed out of their homes are going to want to be more aggressive uh, in their ability to work out loan modifications with the homeowners in their state. And so that provides a bit of a tension between certain AGs. Is there a concern to kind of present a, a united front? Is that something that people are, are, are cognizant of as this process unfolds, or is it more about getting to the final point in negotiation? Well, it's two things. It's trying to get an agreement that most people can live with. Also, it's trying to, uh, from the bank's perspective, you really don't want multiple uh, rules that you have to follow, follow state by state. That's a problem for you. Mm -hmm. If one group of states has one set of rules, and then you have some breakaway states that have their own rules. Now, it's not a problem if the breakaway states have rules that are less stringent than mm -hmm. the ones with which you agree that have more stringent rules. Because once you apply with the stringent standard, you've satisfied the less stringent standard. So that may not necessarily be a problem. So how do you see this all playing out? We have this set of rules put out by the OCC. It doesn't seem as if the state attorneys general are going to be able to come up with uh, hard and fast finalized rules anytime soon. Where does this leave us? I think the negotiations will continue. I think there will be an, an agreement with mm. state attorneys general. Do you think we'll see one within 12 months? Yes, I do think you'll see one. It may not be what all the AGs want, mm -hmm. and it may not be something that's very desirable, but I think you will see an agreement on certain aspects of the process. Other parts of the agreement are very tough. For example, uh, the mandatory penalties that are liquidated damages, meaning a specified amount, that's going to be a problem for banks to agree to. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a real sticking point. The, the what, amount or, or whether to pay it the, at all? Whether to pay it at all and a large amount. I think what you'll find um, uh, easier to reach resolution on are things like having a designated call center where a homeowner can call into a particular number and speak to a human being or leave a voicemail and interface or interact with a particular person at the bank to resolve the homeowner's concerns. That you can reach an agreement on. You can maybe reach an agreement on what the banks might do to discuss loan modification with a homeowner and what the homeowner's rights can be in that context. Those are easier points of view. Also, whether or not if the bank is discussing loan modification with a homeowner, whether it will suspend foreclosure enforcement proceedings. Those are kinds of agreements that banks can agree to for a limited period of time. Mm -hmm. Let's switch gears here. Sure. Uh, when you went to Patterson, uh, after spending time in the state attorney general's office in New Jersey, you helped establish a sports law department. We've been following the uh, labor talks uh, in the NFL uh, pretty seriously over the last couple months. What do you make of uh, what's happening there? Do you think we'll have an NFL season this year? Well, periodically, you have these kinds of fights mm. uh, between labor and management in the sports area. Everyone knows it's in the best interest of the game and of both sides to have a game mm -hmm. and a series of regular games. No one really wants a strike and no one really wants replacement players coming in to play regular NFL games. That's happened once. Fans don't particularly like it and don't respond well to it. So I do think they'll reach an agreement. I think the closer we get to the opening of the camps and the start of the preseason, uh, the more likely you're going to see um, people being a little bit more creative and a little bit more flexible to reach an agreement. And we're coming up on a similar round of negotiations for the NBA. Do you think it will follow the way the NFL has gone, or do you think the NFL is sorting this out in a way that's going to save the NBA a little bit of grief? I think there will be lessons <laughs> learned you would hope, by the right? NBA. <laughs> one would think that there will be lessons learned. Because one of the concerns, even though you have TV contracts, and even though those TV contracts may be solid and revenue may continue to flow under those TV contracts, there will come a point where the networks, if they don't have games, or if they don't have games that are contemplated by the contract, are going to think very seriously about uh, whether or not they can continue to pay the same dollar to the leagues. And you're going to have advertisers that shift their dollars elsewhere right. because they're not getting the, the demographic that they want in the audience. Yeah, I think that's something that hasn't been touched on too much in the media. It's ultimately going to be driven by advertising 
revenues. That's what's going to solve this situation, so to speak. Exactly. Advertising revenues pay the networks. The networks end up paying the leagues. Mm. So if the revenues start to drop off, or if the advertisers start to pick alternative fora for uh, communicating their messages, uh, you're going to start seeing the networks um, leaning on the owners somewhat to say, listen, we have to get resolution mm -hmm. with this because we're going to see a decline in our revenues. All right. Well, we'll have to see how it goes. Strange days indeed. Peter, thanks so much for coming in today. Thank you. That's Peter Harvey. He's a partner at the law firm Paris and Belknap based here in New York City. If you'd like to learn more about the issues we just discussed, go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.